from my colleagues, Hugi and Francesca, uh, to shine light on co-budget history and also what might expect us in the future. Um, of course, we will have the chance also to address questions to all presenters and also to panelists later on. So feel free whenever you have a question to put it in the chat and we will collect them and address them at the end of today's session. Over to you. Thanks, David. Thank I'm you, David. super excited to be here with Yugi to finally share a little bit more about CoBudget's past, present and future. And um, yeah, I'm especially excited because I think it's quite an interesting story and one that's a little bit different from maybe a lot of open source projects where we maybe see projects uh, fork over time. So split out into lots of different streams versus in this case, actually, uh, the story is really two paths that have come together from quite different starting points and two different communities that have actually merged into, into one tool and, uh, and one brand and one pra uh, project. So um, yeah, I guess just really briefly before Hugi and I both sort of share about each of those like past origins, um, I guess I just wanted to sort of, uh, yeah, give a quick sense in terms of um, how did we get to, to where we are right now and, and what is the co-budget that we're, we're building? Because in a way, uh, in both cases, the way Cobudge emerged was really as a practice, um, a practice that was really coming out of a couple communities that were experimenting with new ways of making decisions, uh, distributing, sorry, distributing leadership. And in both those cases, it was always open source. It was very collaborative. It was transparent. And like from the beginning, the idea was really to, let's say, walk the talk, if that's the word we can use, and build the technology and the practice through the, the lived experience of those communities. And so um, what actually happened about a year ago, a little bit more than that, is that Hugi and I, we had met through a couple different uh, communities, but we basically both realized that we were very passionate about how to build technology differently how to not have to go down the sort of uh, venture-backed startup route to build technology, but instead really that, that we both cared a lot about how can we actually build infrastructure that is a commons and that can really be sustainably maintained and help organizations, networks, communities that want to organize more collectively. And so we realized from that sort of shared uh, mission that we that we both have, that actually we were holding different threads that would be really interesting to join together. And so actually in May last year, we brought together both of our teams and then uh, sort of started exploring, could we could we actually work on this together and and merge these two different platforms into one tool? And so that's what we ended up deciding to do and have been working on sort of in the background for the last year. And so that's why we're just really excited to now sort of come out and share this more broadly where we've gotten. And also especially because we're really trying to, to develop this technology and this practice further with a very ecosystemic approach. So basically trying to build on the strengths of each other and of other organizations out there that are doing similar things so that we don't have to try to do everything perfectly, but instead uh, find collaborators to work with to basically sort of grow the ecosystem around co-budget and, and other similar tools. So I guess one, one thing I just wanna note as an example is uh, Open Collective that Hugi will also say more about later that is already becoming a really strong partner and a super exciting collaboration in terms of some other important infrastructure in this space of uh, new ways of organizing. And that we're, we're trying to see how can we work together as partners in, in growing this technology in a different way. So I think um, with that as sort of like the general, the general idea of what we're trying to do, um, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Hugi to dive into one of the, one of the streams of CoBudget's origins, and then I'll, I'll share about the second one. Over to you. So it's my uh, my screen shared now. The slides are up. Excellent. 
Yeah, right. I'm going to take us on a little journey. As Francesca said, it's sort of, there's an origin story now of co-budget um, having come really from two directions and synthesized into one thing. And this is the first time we really get to sit down and, and tell that new origin story to everyone. So we were going to take you through sort of those two journeys that join in May last year. And the one that I'm going to focus on in the beginning comes uh, from my end. Um, it really starts at a place called the Borderland. The Borderland is called so because it is supposed to be the borderland between dreams and reality. And according to uh, some crazy hippies in a quarry, that's how that place looks, at least similar to that at, at that point. Uh, the borderland had really lofty ideas for how it wanted to co-create ever since it started. The first real year was 2011. And right from the start, the idea was that people would not just come together and co-create this uh, festival one week of the year. The idea from the start was that that sort of lived on throughout the year as an ongoing collaborative practice of creativity and, and prototyping. And right from the start, there was this idea of something called the dreams platform. People would go in and they would propose a project that they wanted to do at the borderland. And these projects didn't necessarily have to come with a budget. Uh, a lot of it just had to do with making people excited and aware of what you wanted to do. And this is that from 2014, but the Dreams platform actually existed from 2011. Um, it didn't really have any uh, co-budgeting or anything of that sort. The only participatory thing that you could do as somebody who was not uploading your own project was just to click the vote button. And that was it. Um, but you could get engaged in other people's projects through just seeing them on the platform. And you could, as somebody who had a project, also ask for grants to carry that project out. Of course, at the start, the borderland being quite small, um, there wasn't that many much money to, to be had. But as the uh, borderland grew, it started to become more and more of an issue to understand how do we distribute this money uh, that we have so that as many of these projects can be realized as possible while still understanding that we don't have infinite resources and sometimes priorities have to be made. But by 2015, that was actually a 41 page document um, of applications to distribute 20,000 euros by committee. It wasn't really sustainable anymore and it was starting to cause quite a lot of friction in the community, quite frankly. So an idea started to rise up about, okay, can we do this differently and crowdsource it and actually make the whole process participatory? Uh, and at the same time, then also solving this, this problem of scalability um, uh, while still not doing what a lot of other large festivals do and say that like, look, if you want small money, you got to fundraise that yourself. You're not going to get it through the, the main channels. You know, Only the big projects uh, can apply for that money. It's not what we want it to do. So in 2016, we uh, built this platform or we, we lost it for the Borderlands 2016. And it was similar to the old one, except now we spread out the responsibility to go uh, distribute that funding to the participants themselves. It was a very simple thing. It looked like this, uh, ugly as nails, uh, built completely bootstrapped with only volunteer resources. And uh, it worked. It worked well enough that, um, people could use it and it was an improvement on the old system. We also, of course, made it open source and it actually sort of took off as a little weird open source project and got forked a bunch of times. It ended up being used, uh, namely at an equivalent sort of festival in Israel where they took it and rewrote about 70% of the code. And the next year in 2017, we just took that code and we ran with that and we uh, created our own version of it. And, you know, thank God, because the borderland had grown by that point. And that's the quarry that you see right there at that point. So, so there was certainly a need for better technology. So suddenly we had this pretty good sort of internal Kickstarter participatory uh, budgeting tool uh, that was really geared towards making people think about and collaborate with each other on the dreams that they had. Uh, but we didn't really stop there in terms of just co-budgeting. We also did uh, basically participatory reviewing 
of the projects. So of course, there are some guidelines to what can get funded and what cannot. That used to be vetted by a little committee. But again, we thought we could do better. And we said, that, like, look, let's just distribute that vetting to the community itself. And being the borderland, we could get away with being very playful. So this was the first version of that. It was just these little monsters that you clicked and they got very angry. If, if you were to say that something was breaking a guideline, you, you told the reason and then it was sort of resolved. Platform was very playful. Um, we could do that, of course, because we didn't have to really adapt to any other use cases. Um, and it really worked. Uh, you know, we uh, the borderline grew in membership between 2016 and 2019 to just over 3,000 uh, participants, and the budget uh, sort of grew to um, yeah, the, grew basically relative to the to the number of participants. And participation of those members in dream granting was pretty staggering. If you know anything in participatory uh, processes, getting people involved can be hard. But we actually reached um, just around 50% of the total participants of the borderland participated in distributing the money to the projects. Um, so I think that was a very big success. Now, because we could look at those like successes and because we saw that there was potential in this, we went to some Swedish um, innovation granting agencies, one for culture and one for uh, really technology entrepreneurship. And we asked for some money to develop um, this tech. And there were good calls available for civic tech where something open source and participatory really fit in. So we got um, enough money to really build a new version of it that could be multi-tenant, that could accept uh, multiple uh, organizations using it, something that could really be software as a service and be used by people around the world. And that's where we are now. That's what we've built. That's what the Borderland uses today. And that's what now is called co-budget because of this amazing story that Fran hinted at before. And now I'm handing over to Fran to tell the other path. Yes, exactly. So at the same time as all of this was happening in uh, in Denmark and uh, in a bunch of other communities, uh, at the other end of the world, all the way in New Zealand, there was the Inspiral Network. And Inspiral actually started also um, around 2010. And it really was at first sort of a network of it was always called people that are working on things that matter and want to spend more time working on things that matter. But basically, uh, lots of uh, social entrepreneurs, freelancers, people that wanted to start their own business, but that wanted to support each other to do that. And so what was really interesting about Inspiral is uh, because of how it was set up, they really became a sort of incubation lab for lots of new practices around participatory governance uh, both when it came to the actual practices, but also when it came to software, because there was actually a lot of developers that were part of that collective. And so one of the main areas that actually CoBudget sort of emerged out of was something called Inspiral Services at the time. And that actually uh, was sort of like a web development cooperative that was providing services around web development. And so you can see here, this is uh, Alana Irving, who was one of the members of uh, Inspiral and Inspiral Services, and was really one of the people that drove a lot of the sort of innovation around these practices related to money. And um, as you can sort of see in this crazy drawing here, there was like a lot of different pieces that were starting to be developed that people were just experimenting with, like, what is the infrastructure we need to sort of run a distributed web development co-op at the time? And so part of that was things like My Inspiral, which was like sort of having your own parallel bank account and fictional money. And one key piece within that was the evolution of CoBudget, which really actually started out as a big spreadsheet and some first experiments that Alana had kicked off around participatory budgeting that was very laborious and involved a lot of copy pasting and yeah, basically a lot of manual labor. And so because of that, and due to the fact that there were so many developers in Inspiral, we could sort of see as it matured and as the practices that Inspiral was using, they were beginning to actually codify them in technology. And so it's quite interesting actually to look um, that so specifically in the case of, of CoBudget, um, 
there was a need for sort of a process that made it easier for people to engage with the budget, um, but really also somehow not having too much of a mental load on people um, in doing that. And so that was that was where the technology came in to somehow simplify and make make this more accessible. And so that wasn't only happening in the area of money, but also there's a tool called Lumio that people have maybe heard of, which is a consent decision making tool. And then there's also things like the Inspiral Handbook and all these different areas where people were basically developing software to support the practices that were emerging. And so from that, finally then, um, in 2014, the first version of CoBudget as a piece of software actually was launched. Um, there's a great little video online that you could see um, by this woman, Charlie, sort of announcing uh, the launch of it. And you can sort of see some screenshots of what it used to look like. And in comparison to the Borderland example, we can see that this is much more like focused on the finances. Uh, it's a more sort of a rational, clean looking tool, less like creativity and craziness, but more like a looks like a financial tool, let's say. And so then um, going from this, this first prototype, uh, if you go um, two years later, uh, we actually had a guy called Derek Razo and Eugene Lynch that also managed to raise some grant fu funding um, from a philanthropic organization and were able to build a new, a new version of CoBudget that you can see here uh, in the screenshot that sort of is the one that actually, I would say uh, I and my colleagues in Greater Then started working with then in 2017. So we can see that then that actually is the CoBudget that many of you who've been using it have been familiar with and which of course has now changed. But basically uh, this is the co-budget the way it was until basically uh, March this year. Uh, we can see here like some screenshots of Inspiral and also WeShare, which is the, the network through which I actually got to know co-budget because that was the, the group where we were experimenting a lot with, with money and got excited about it. But basically the, the way that I actually got into this project is that in 2017, I started Greater Than um, as a collective and was really interested in, in focusing on the topic of money in uh, like new ways of organizing. And so we actually took on the stewardship of co-budget. We sort of took it from Inspiral and said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna try to get it to its next phase because it wasn't being held at the time anymore from, from those people that were there previously. And so that's basically what then got us to today so um, now basically you can see, uh, since we uh, did the shift that I told you about earlier and Hugi and I decided that we were gonna try this merger, uh, this is now the new, the new Inspiral page on CoBudget where actually uh, a round is happening right now. And so that's sort of, yeah, the full circle of what got us to where we are now. And I mean, I guess one thing that's maybe just also worth mentioning is that the approach that I and really everyone in Greater Than has come to this from has always really been focused on the practice. So co-budget really being a codification of the practices around collaborative funding that we wanna see. And so uh, this is really the, the larger mission that, that we're all here for, which is how we can spread those practices more as a way to really shift how money and power flows in society. And so that's that's what we're hoping to sort of grow out from here. But with that, I'll, I'll hand back to Hugi to tell us a bit more about what's actually coming next or where we are now and what's what's coming up. Yeah, thanks, Fran. So, right, so now we sit here with the new co-budget, which uh, already has this um, platform which we've now invested in for the last couple of years in order to get it to a place where we think it can be really useful and where you can just register and sign up and create your own organization. So what's ahead now for CoBudget? Well, this is sort of what we think is like the, the theory of change or like the, the way we want people to think about it. These three pillars of doing this. Uh, one of them is to dream together. And remember, that was sort of the, the origins of the Borderland, the Dreams platform, the, the ideation, the craziness, the ideas of dreaming together of what could be possible, right? And then you have the, the funding together, the part which is about making it 
realizable, but breaking it down into budgets, understanding what's needed, making sure that the people who can make that happen have the resources they want and make sure that the people who can know what's best to allocate to get those resources to allocate. Um, and that's the fun together part. And that's really where the Inspiro co-budget started from. So it's so great that these two are, are coming together like this at these two pillars. And then the last one is to be able to realize these projects. And that's where we also hope this co-budget is going to grow, um, both uh, in terms of being able to follow up on the platform, but also in terms of being able to understand how is this money then being spent for this project. And that's where we want to look at a little bit, how we're going to achieve that. One thing I just want to announce right now is that, you know, co-budget, neither of these implementations never had any way for you to be able to actually get new money in. It was always the case that we assumed that you already had some sort of money in your community that you had fundraised through some other means. And that's the money that you distributed through co-budget. Well, we've built something now that makes it possible for you to raise money directly uh, to your ideas or to buckets as they're called on co-budget. Um, so this feature is still in beta phase, uh, but it will be possible now to just use your card go into a bucket and fund that directly if you want to fill it up with more money that the organization currently doesn't have. And we think that this is a very cool and end way for people to be able to fundraise for uh, community projects, not just fundraising now just for the organization as a whole and what it might do, but very specifically asking people to put money towards specific goals. And we think that that's gonna be a pretty attractive offer. Uh, but there's also the whole point that where does that money end up, right? I mean, it relies on you having the ability to open a bank account, some sort of nonprofit uh, or some sort of organization that could hold that money. Not everyone has the ability or time or willingness to do that. And this is where it's so great for us to work with Open Collective, which is why these two things fit together super well. So if you have your own bank account, fine, we'll hook up co-budget to the independent organizational uh, sort of payment platforms uh, that can handle those payments and payouts, right? But if you don't, then what we wanna do is integrate it with Open Collective so that you can be fiscally hosted by a fiscal host in Open Collective and still be able to receive money directly from people through co-budget that ends up on Open Collective where you can manage the money. So what we sort of get is this, right? We get an ecosystem where we imagine that Open Collective is the way in which your community achieves financial sustainability, right? And co-budget becomes the place in which you dream and allocate resources. It is really the place in which, you know, the, the, the sort of, so what should we do with the money? That whole step comes in there. And then Open Collective comes in again to help you make sure the money gets to where it needs to go. Right. So these tools together really fit amazingly well. And the way we like to think about it sometimes is that really, you know, DAOs are all the rage right now for very good reason. They allow us to do really cool stuff, but we don't necessarily need to do that with crypto on the blockchain. Uh, we think that this is in some ways the equivalent of doing a DAO in existing systems, but with innovative tools that make it possible for you to do it really well. So that's sort of our idea for where this could be going as an ecosystem. And with that, I'm going to hand over to, yes, to Fran. I just want to add one more last thing on that, um, which is that basically, so part of this ecosystem could obviously be many other tools uh, in addition to open collective. So there's sort of like, we see this as a huge like opener for many different collaborations that could happen around this. And this is also why we've decided that, so CoBudget has become uh, an independent cooperative in Sweden. So we actually just got the bank account. And the idea is that that's really where the open source code lives. Like that's where the, the tool is. And that then around that, we can really develop this ecosystem of individuals working on it, but also partner organizations that are basically supporting with different pieces. And so that's sort of how we've evolved the relationship now of these different organizations to each other. And so Greater Than is an example of one of them that's also really focused on giving the support services around how to actually do this collaborative governance. But basically, uh, CoBudget now is its own its own co-op. So I just wanted to add that. But um, Certainly, 100%. Thanks. Yes.